Christ is risen. Welcome to Faith Lutheran Church. Today is the second Sunday of Easter. In this morning's gospel account, Jesus appears out of nowhere, or some would say thin air, whichever you prefer, and says these words, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Well, it comes a little bit later in the gospel account. This morning, we will spend time asking and answering the question, what does this mean? What did it mean then? And what does it mean for you as a baptized believer in Christ in your walk of faith? This is what we will be pondering in our hearts and minds this morning. We have three birthdays of which we know. Um, April the 9th, Lorraine Frailing. Wave, Lorraine. There she is. Um, Alma Kohlberg is not here. She may indeed watch the video later, so we'll sing happy birthday to her as well. And Lois Klebaum. Where is Lois? Is she, oh, there she is. Hello, Lois. We will be singing happy birthday. Um, I never, I was told never to ask, I'm not going to, I'm not going to keep going. I'm going to stop. All right. Let's sing happy birthday. Now, there are no anniversaries of which we know. Are there any anniversaries that you know of? Or birthdays? Did we miss anyone? Very good. Before we begin our worship service, we'll ask you to stand, wave to each other as a way of acknowledging, and then wave to the camera if you're comfortable doing that. And then we'll start. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. We join together in our opening hymn.
The congregation may be seated. My friends in Christ, since we are here gathered to delight ourselves in the Word of God, let us with repentant hearts confess our sins before our Heavenly Father, seeking His forgiveness in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. O Lord, our God, hear us as we pray. We confess that we have not walked in your faithfulness, turning away from you when we should be turning toward you. Father, forgive us. Have mercy upon us, Lord Jesus. Renew us, Spirit of Truth. My friends in Christ, I am with you to save you and deliver you, declares the Lord. Through Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and coming again, you have been delivered from your enemies of sin, death, and the devil. Keep his saving, steadfast love before your eyes and walk by faith in his promises. As one called to be your pastor and commissioned by Jesus to deliver the delight of his word, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand as we sing our next hymn. The congregation may be seated. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. 
For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the well-being of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We hear God's word. The first reading this morning is from Acts, the fourth chapter. The full number who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common, and with great power the apostles were giving the testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what they were sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as they had need. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from 1 John, the first and second chapters. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which you looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest and we have seen it, and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to you. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that your joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the appropriation for our sin and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. On the evening of that first day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. But now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. 
So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hands into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand, and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him and said, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The congregation, please remain standing as we sing our sermon hymn. Grace, mercy, and the peace of God be to you from the risen Christ, our Savior. Amen. The text is the gospel. Please be seated. 
Christ is risen. Hallelujah. There are two kinds of evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. Let's call them positive and negative, but not thinking about them as good or bad, the way the words negative and positive sometimes can be taken. There is the negative evidence, and I'll explain what I mean by that by providing the examples. The negative evidence is that there was an open, empty tomb, a lack of a body. The grave clo cloths were folded and neatly set aside, the head covering folded separately, and the most important thing of all, there was no body. If there had been a body, there is no doubt the Romans and the religious leaders of Jerusalem would have paraded the body around out in public through the streets to put an end to the claim that he had risen from the dead. Pardon me. That's all they needed to do. The negative evidence all points to the same conclusion, that Jesus had risen from the dead. But those are arguments from silence. And as we all know, in a debate, an argument from silence is the weakest form of argument of all. The negative evidence proves that Jesus wasn't in the grave, but it does not prove what happened to him. You can't make an argument from the resurrection, for the resurrection of the body from an empty tomb and a folded up burial shroud. That's where the resurrection appearances of Jesus now come into play. These are the positive evidence. The disciples didn't claim that they believed Jesus had risen from the dead. They stated it as a fact. They gave eyewitness testimony. We are eyewitnesses of these things. They are speaking under divine threat of perjury. Not only did the women and the 11 disciples see Jesus, or they talked to him, they touched him, and they ate fish with him. But Paul states that over 500 people saw him on one single occasion. That amounts to overwhelming positive eyewitness evidence for the bodily resurrection of Christ. Jesus first appeared to his inner core of disciples late in the afternoon of that first Easter Sunday, the first Sunday of the week. The disciples were all together in a single room, perhaps the upper room, of three days before. The doors, well, they were bolted shut out of fear. The disciples were afraid, light, rightly, of the religious authorities, figuring they were successful in crucifying Christ. Now they would go after his followers, as those types of leaders are wont to do. This was a frightened group of believers, followers, whose leader had been brutally killed right before their very eyes. They had left everything to follow Jesus, their homes, their livelihood, their faith, safety, and security. Delete the word faith there. Now they had nothing, and they were scared. Who wouldn't be? I know I would, and can I be bold enough to say you probably would be too? And so into this locked room of frightened disciples, Jesus appears. Notice, he does not knock on the door. It probably wouldn't have worked if he had. Knock, knock. Who's there? Jesus. Yeah, right. Quick, Peter. 
bolt that door. Actually, it's true. Bolted doors don't matter to Jesus, neither do locked ones. Remember who he is. He is the eternal divine word who made and upholds all things. He's the eternal son of the father, true God of true God. And now that his work is done, he doesn't hold back on his divine power. He can make his presence known when, where, and how he chooses. And so he just appears in the midst of them, probably scaring the daylights out of them. The first words he speaks are the first blessing of the resurrection. Peace. Peace be with you. It's a wonderful, lovely word, that word peace. We pray for peace in the world, peace in our homes and neighborhoods, peace in our hearts. Peace means the absence of warfare, the end of all the killing and terror. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom, which is an even bigger word than our word peace. Because here's the thing about the word shalom. It's a double greeting used for hello and goodbye. Shalom means harmony, wholeness, everything in its place. Peace, shalom I leave with you. My peace, my shalom I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. They are the positive evidence. The same Jesus who was nailed to a cross and pierced by a spear is alive and well. The lamb who was slain lives, and he has the wounds to prove it. Thomas wanted to see those wounds. Who could blame him? Uh, you know what? Let's be frank with each other, shall we? We're in church. I think Thomas gets a bum rap when people call him Doubting Thomas. You know, the gospel never, ever calls him that. He's called Thomas Didymus, the twin, but he's never called Doubting. Unbelieving, but not Doubting. He even says flat out, unless I see the nail and spear marks and touch them with my own hands, I'm not going to believe it. Why? He wants to be sure it's the right Jesus. The crucified Jesus. He wants a Jesus with nails and nail holes in him. And Jesus accommodates him. The next Sunday, when Thomas was with them, he shows Thomas his hands and his side. Notice that Jesus knew what Thomas had said because he was present at that conversation too. And he says to Thomas, go ahead, put your finger in the nail hole. Put your hand into the spear hold. Don't be unbelieving, but believe. And Thomas does. He believes and he confesses in what is the most flat-out confession of faith in Jesus that we have in the New Testament. My Lord and my God. I hope you realize that what Jesus did for Thomas that Sunday, he does for you each and every Sunday. He speaks his shalom, his peace, and he presents his wounds to you in his body and blood, the fruits of the sacrifice. They had Jesus and his wounds in front of them all those years ago. You have Jesus and his wounds in front of you every time we receive the true body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. Those are his wounds for you. That's what it means for you now.
His own body given as bread to eat. His own blood given as wine to drink. And he says to us, as he did to Thomas, don't be believe unbelieving anymore. Trust me. I died for you and took away all of your sins. I rose from the dead for you to show my victory over sin and death. I give you my peace, my shalom, a peace you cannot find anywhere else in this world. And so that you have something concrete and real, as real as my hands and feet and side, I give you my real, true, very body and my real, true, very blood as your food and drink. The second time he sends them, he says, peace be with you. He sends them this time. He takes those disciples and now makes them apostles. The word apostle means one sent. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. They weren't going to hang around in this locked upper room for the rest of their lives. They were the apostles. They were sent. Sent into the world for which Jesus died. A dangerous world filled with terror, unbelief, hatred, war, violence. A world that crucified Jesus and wants the same to be truthful for his disciples. But he sends them, and he was sent by the Father, as he was sent by the Father. The word apostle means one who is sent. We say that the church is apostolic, which really means two things. It is apostolic in this first sense that we teach what the apostles taught. And we know that from the scriptures. It also means that the church is sent out into the world to disciple the nations by baptizing and teaching, to bring the good news of the death of Jesus and his resurrection to the ends of the earth. Now Jesus doesn't leave his church short of breath though. If the church is going to preach and proclaim She's going to need breath. Jesus breathes on them. As he once breathed life into Adam, and he once blew across the waters of the deep in creation, and the waters of the Red Sea and the dead dry bones that Ezekiel saw, he breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. You can think of that as a little Pentecost. The big Pentecost would come 50 days later. This was the little one, ordaining his apostles with his spirited breath and his words. He gives them authority to do what God alone can do, forgive sins. The sins of any you forgive are forgiven them, and whatever of theirs you bind, it is bound. And that gives you a little bit of insight as to what goes on when you hear the words of the absolution every Sunday, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of God, forgive you all your sins. No pastor has the authority to say those words in and of himself. The church authorizes pastors, gives them permission in the same way that Jesus authorized the disciples to take the message to the world. The permission. Your sins are forgiven right here and right now in this time and in this place. And they, are, they have been forgiven in Christ Jesus literally from all eternity since he's the Lamb of God that was slain and from the foundations of the world. And they will always be forgiven, so that on the last day when Jesus comes to judge the living and the dead, the verdict will be not guilty, all thanks to Jesus. And just in case you missed it, there's still one more gift. 
a bonus blessing, an Easter beatitude from Jesus to you. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Jesus had you in mind when he said those words. You can't see Jesus. You didn't see him the first time, but you can hear his word. You can't touch his wounds like Thomas did that first time, but you can eat and drink his body and blood. You didn't see him then. You don't see him now the way he was, but you will see him soon the way he is. Now we simply believe, we trust, we take Jesus at his word, and there is no surer word than Jesus and his word. The word of Jesus. Blessed are you, believer. Blessed are you. Peace be with you. Amen. And now the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds in him forever. Amen. Please stand as we sing our hymn of response.
the congregation may be seated. We confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe. We hear the musical offertory. So in our prayers this morning, we're going to include some people that are not listed in the bulletin, and some who are. Um, we will, of course, remember the family of George Walter as they mourn his passing. The funeral was on Friday. And then um, Lois Klebaum lost a sister this past week to death, and so we want to remember Lois in our prayers. And Cesar, Cesar is here this morning, wave. Now, Cesar, you and I have talked about this. I'm going to pronounce your last name, and you tell me if I got it right. Capronchai. Capronchai. Sorry? Good enough. Good enough, well. I'm, I'm going to get this right. That's important, because I have a name that causes a lot of difficulty too. So, Capron Chai. That's different than the first time. Okay. Well, that changes everything. I'm not going to do it the third time. 
All right, so we will, he's been a little bit ill, and we're glad he's back today, and we prayed for you last week, but we'll pray for you again today. Uh, and then I'll just go over the names now, and then I'll, I'll say their names again when it comes time to pray. Lorraine Kendall, Jolene Evans, Lucas Mack, Bill Schultz, Bernice Filippo, Alma Kohlberg, Warren Sass, Elsa Schmeling, Barry Hembroff, and Dale Pfeiffer. Each of those people is at varying points in their health journey, and so we want to ask God to be with them. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. <coughs> Heavenly Father, your Son is the first fruit born from, for, is the firstborn from the dead. In Him, we have been reborn into a new and living hope. Nurture us with the pure milk of your Word, that we may grow to maturity of faith and have everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy. Grant to those ordained for your service the gift of the Spirit, wisdom that comes down from above, and grace to faithfully fulfill their holy calling where you have placed them. Be also, we pray, with the people in their congregations whom they serve, as they live out their baptized vocational callings in their lives hidden in you. Lord, in your mercy. As your people are united in the common life and love of our Savior, grant that we who would share that life and love with those in need. Lord, in your mercy. O God of all justice and peace, we cry out to you in the midst of the pain and trauma of the violence and fear which prevails in the Holy Land these last six months. We pray that you would be with those who need you in these days of suffering and for all the people of the Middle East. While we pray to you, O Lord, for an end to the violence and establishment of peace, we also ask you to bring an end to the suffering and, of course, the war in the Middle East. Lord, in your mercy, for an end to wars, especially for all wars, and an end to the war in Ukraine and violence. We pray for the servicemen and women who preserve the peace, for the government and those who lead us, and for the cause of justice among the nations and all those oppressed. We pray for peace in Ukraine. Lord, in your mercy, Build up the households of your people, that your holy children, begotten in baptism, may grow in your grace and share together in your forgiveness and life. Lord, in your mercy, Heavenly Father, you have instituted authorities to carry out your justice. Bless all who make, administer, and judge the laws of our land. Give them wisdom, integrity, and honor to serve according to your good mercy. Lord, in your mercy, as your son's wounds brought gladness and peace to the troubled disciples, we ask you to give your presence and comfort to those in our midst who are troubled in illness. For Cesar, for Lorraine, Jolene, Lucas, Bill, Bernice, Alma, Warren, Elsa, Barry, and Dale. Lord, in your mercy, comfort also those who weep. Especially we bring before you the family of George Walter and Lois Kleebaum. With the blessed joy, we pray that you would comfort those who weep. With the blessed joy of Easter morning, Lord, in your mercy, Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you that out of your indescribable grace, for the sake of your Son, 
you have given us the Holy Gospel and instituted the blessed sacraments, that through them we may have comfort and the forgiveness of sins. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may heartily believe your word, and through the holy sacraments establish our faith day by day, until at last we obtain eternal salvation. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Together we pray the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Please stand. Receive now the benediction and blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen. We join together in our closing hymn. Please be seated. Thank you for being with us in worship this morning. Thank you to those who have taken the time to watch the um, video as well. One special announcement, we have a number of lilies here, and I've been asked to ask you if you would like to take a lily home, first come, first serve. So they're here for you, but Give me a chance to get out <laughs> before I get stampeded. Okay, I have one more announcement, but um, pardon me for a moment here. I just have to get something, and um, Donna, I'm going to be playing something, and I'm going to hold it up to the... Um, it has to do with the announcement, and uh, let's see if we can... Let's see... Will it, oh, just a minute, I have to turn the volume up. Um, does anybody want to know the score in the curling? No, I'm not going to say anything. No, no, I won't. Wait, here's, here's the song. Hello out there, we're on the air. It's hockey night tonight. Tension grows, the whistle blows, and the puck goes down the ice. Louder. The goalie jumps and the players pump, and the fans all go insane. All right. 
enough of that. So that was a way to introduce the luncheon that's coming up on, is it the 18th? The 18th. Murray Wagner is going to be doing uh, the hockey quiz. Um, and so we'd like to invite you to be a part of that. Um, so that's coming up the 18th of April um, as part of the luncheon program. I'm looking forward to that. Murray, you suggested that we wear hockey jerseys. I just have one question. What hockey jersey are you going to wear, Murray? <laughs> I already know the answer. You already know the answer. All right, is there anything else? All right, give me a moment to get going. Wait, is there anything else? No? Sorry? Jacob Grace Oh, yes, let's grace, always. Let's pray. Yes, because right after the service is over, in fact, let me just get down there, but you all go because we have that potluck coffee break, so don't wait for me, but let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us time today to feed on your word for our souls. Thank you for the time we're about to receive, that we would be nourished in our bodies. Bless the food that we are about to receive and the hands that have taken the time to lovingly prepare it for us. Bless also the time that we get to spend with each others, with each other, brothers and sisters in Christ, united in one faith, one Lord, one baptism. And bless this time together, we pray. In the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Go in peace.